our second to last event. Um, we've been doing these for quite a while now, and it's all about, if, if you can look up at the slides, what has our series been about this whole time? Okay, penguins, okay. Yeah, so I hear penguins, I'm hearing. Who else? Antarctica, yes. So it's not just about Antarctica, but it's Antarctic Women in Science is our entire series. So a bunch of different women who have done research all the way down in Antarctica have been flying in every single month to come and talk to us about what they do. Um, tonight we have a really interesting one. She is kind of a big leader. So if you are interested in leadership, there's a lot of a lot of opportunities for you if you are an adept leader. So if you can lead very well, no matter where you go, what you do, whatever you get into, you can make a difference in whatever you want to do, right? So leadership is critical. So she is a pretty big leader in terms of what goes on down in Antarctica. So we'll be hearing from her today. Um, but before we do that, we are going to jump right into a quick intro presentation just about Antarctica from our Teen Science Cafe team. So please give them a big round of applause and we will start. Okay, so I'm going to introduce everyone. We're going to talk a little bit about something that we know all too well here in the U.S., politics, right? We're going to get started by talking about politics just a little bit. There we go. Okay, so Antarctica politics. Who's in Antarctica? Who, who lives? Why do we need to have politics there, right? What, what's politics about? Well, we're going to get into that today just a little bit. We're going to give a quick intro before we hear from the professional about kind of this topic. Um, but yes, I'm going to introduce our Teen Science Cafe. So for those of you who don't know, this is the Teen Science Cafe event. And it is hosted by this lovely group of teens here. And they work together all year long. So they come every single Sunday from 10 o'clock to 2 o'clock in the afternoon. And they are working, working, working. They've gone to do some art projects on the beach where we collect microplastics. Um, but they have done a lot of work and they have influenced quite a bit of people. Um, so yeah, they plan these events. They plan all of these scientific topics with different scientists. And they say, how can we make this applicable for youth? Right, so that's their big goal. You know, it's really easy to get caught up in all of the jargon, all of the technology, right, all of that. But how can we make it so that it's fun, it's accessible for everyone, all of us to join us? So that's what we do. Um, as you can see, here are some of the people that we have talked to in the past about our Antarctic series. So the first uh, woman we've spoken with was Antarctic Pycnogonids. She is, her name is Dr. Amy Moran. Antarctic Pycnogonids are these sea spiders, and they can be the size of a house cat like, or a dinner plate. Um, they look they look uh, fun, and <laughs> that's her research. She goes down there and does all this work with Antarctic sea spiders. They just get really big. Super interesting conversation. Then we moved on to Dr. Margaret Amser. She was awesome. She talked to us about pelagic krill. Did not know that there was so, many, um, so much krill that lives down there. However, they are the backbone of the whole Antarctica. So many animals eat tons and tons of krill, and they have to produce tons and tons of krill. So it's just like a sea of orange in some of her pictures. It was crazy. Um, then we moved on to Dr. Roxanne Beltran, and she talked about Weddell seals. And she gets to understand their diving behavior. So they dive underneath the ice, dive under the water to catch their prey. And what she did was she glued cameras on the chins of all of the seals. And she was able to see them not only catch their prey, but she can record how deep they were going. And she can also record the amount of times they try to capture prey. And it lined up with all this other research. And it, was, it just came together. It was beautiful. It was amazing. I was blown away. Then we have Dr. Kristen O'Brien. And she talked about Antarctic ice fish. So the ice fish down there, right, the water is, is the water hot or cold down there? Yeah, it's freezing, right? So I don't think I'm jumping in anytime soon. I don't even jump into regular pools anymore. Uh, it's just too cold. I won't do it. Uh, but those fish down there do it. <laughs> and how? It's because they have this unique blood. 
uh, that keeps them from freezing. So she just talked about how amazing those fish are and her work with them. Dr. Chris Chang down here, she talked a little bit more about the antifreeze proteins that, that are in the blood of those fish. So it keeps them from freezing, right? Really interesting. How do those fish survive under all that ice? It's crazy. Then we moved on to Dr. Sky Murray. Now Sky was amazing. She is an artist and she draws pretty quickly, but the, the images that she drew were incredible. And she made us really think about how art and science connect. There's a lot of us who maybe are interested in art or do art at school sometimes. And you, I've learned that a lot of teens here in California are crazy good artists. I don't know what, where that's coming from, but we are amazing at art. Um, but a lot of people realize, how can I fuse that with a career, you know, like a long-term career? Well, Dr. Sky Murray, she did that. Um, and she goes down to Antarctica and draws all of these uh, images and she makes all these charts to make science understandable for everyone. Um, can you guys imagine just reading a textbook? I mean, think of the thickest textbook you can, right? Imagine reading that whole textbook and there's no pictures at all. I mean, you're trying to learn the cell, the Golgi bodies, all of that, and there's no pictures. How boring would that be, right? I mean, you would probably check out quickly. So it's incredible how important art really is to science, right? They go hand in hand. So. That's what she talked about. And then Dr. Erin Petit talked about Antarctic glaciers. She is she studies glaciers. I was like, what can you really talk about with glaciers? I thought they were just big piles of rocks or ice or whatever the case is. But really, they move over time. And they kind of act like silly putty. And that's what we learned last time. We had She gave us uh, some silly putty to play with. And if you set it down, it's kind of firm for a second. And then slowly but surely, it starts expanding. And that's what glaciers do. They move throughout the earth, and they make all of these canyons and things like that. So they're moving objects, and I would have never thought that. So we've had a lot of cool discoveries along the way with this event series. Um, now let's do our turn and talk together. So with the person next to you, the person right next to you, if you don't know them, that's OK. Just turn and say, what's up? My name is so-and-so-and-so. Um, but what comes to your mind when you think of politics? Let's just get our juices flowing in our heads and our brains. What do you think about politics? Okay, ready, set, go. Go ahead and talk to your neighbor. All righty, everyone. We're going to come back together. Tell me, what are some of the things that you think about when we talk about politics? Go ahead and just either raise your hand or shout it out. It's totally fine. OK, OK. We shouted that one out. Biden. OK, so we're talking about presidents, right? What do presidents do? I am screaming. Not ruin the I'm kidding. OK, so presidents. OK, all right. What about you, right? It gets heated, doesn't it? OK, mm -hmm. what do you think? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, so you're tying in how environmental topics and things like that are oftentimes included in politics, right? Who oversees these things? Who governs what happens, right? And, and as you heard earlier, there was some outburst, right? Oh, there was politicians, right? So who leads, right? Leadership is difficult, and it evokes strong emotions. So if you are a leader, 
or if you are a policymaker or you enforce policy, you might run into some challenges, right? People might not agree. Yes. Okay, absolutely. Okay. Absolutely. Okay, so as Gen Z would say, you ate, right? You absolutely <laughs> ate. <laughs> That's all I can say, you ate. Um, but as you can kind of hear, it's not just the top, right? There's a lot of people that you have to govern and they have a say in what happens to our world, right? So they get appointed by people, I guess you can call them laymen, but people who are just here in our environment. Um, we all can do our part to help the ecosystem, right? We can talk to our politicians or policy makers to help with certain environmental things, right? Cool, so now let's move on to our next question. Thank you for all of your input. What do we already know about Antarctic politics? If there's nothing, that's okay. Tell your neighbor that you know nothing, okay? Ready, turn to your neighbor and talk. Okay, so let's come back together. My friend right there in the back, if you wanna come up to the, one of the first two rows with us, join us so that way you can join in conversation with us, okay? We don't want you to be by yourself. We're all, we're all in this together. Okay, so let me hear some of your thoughts. What do you already know? If it's nothing, that's okay. You could share, with that, share that with me as well. That's, that's information, right? We might not know a lot about it. Yes. Okay. Interesting. Okay, let me pause you right there. Wow, I'm hearing a lot. Absolutely, right? Are there polar bears in Antarctica? Hmm. Are there polar bears in Antarctica? Do you know? Interesting, okay, and as Gen Z would say, you ate as well, okay, you ate. So my two friends here had just raised their hands and they said a couple of things. They were talking about global warming, they were talking about this earth getting hotter, and maybe policy is trying to help stop that, right? We're talking about species and, and their survival, their ability to persist if the temperature gets too hot, right? Um, how can we help stop that? Maybe that's a bit of politics there in Antarctica or policies that can help with that. So that's kind of the general themes that I heard from what you both said. Very good, thank you for sharing, okay? Now here's one last thing. We're all about discovery when it comes to the Aquarium of the Pacific, all about learning, right? What do you want to learn? That's really what, what is important, right? So what would you like to learn about when it comes to to policies or Antarctic governance or things like that, anything Antarctica, what would you guys like to learn? So turn to the person next to you and, and just chat for a couple seconds. If you don't know them, make some friends. I know my friends over there. Um, but yeah, go ahead and turn. OK, 
okay, so I'm kind of hearing it come back together. Let's come back together, and if you can raise your hand, let's see what is something that you would like to know. Okay, yes. Absolutely. Okay, so he's like, I want to learn more about Antarctica. And guess what? That's why we're here. Absolutely. Okay, what else would you like to know? Or do you think you want to know? Yeah. Okay, what an interesting question. Hold on to that one, and we might get that answered at the end, okay? Interesting question. Well, we're talking about, her question was just in general about the temperature, right? What was, what's the temperature gonna be like if things get jumbled around down in Antarctica? How will that impact areas elsewhere in the desert? Who knows, right? Good question. Okay, cool. Any, literally cool, right? Any other questions? Yes. Okay, so what would the government do if we lose all of the glaciers and things in Antarctica starts heating up? What are we gonna do, right? Good, these are all really good questions, right? Um, so we'll learn a little bit more. We're gonna get introduced to um, just a little bit about the history of Antarctica right now, and then we're gonna get into just how governance kind of looks like or has looked like in the past, okay? Just a little bit. All right, so I'm gonna welcome up Vanessa as we get into this one. Thank you for starting us off, Callum. So before we dive into our main topic, we are going to talk about the history of Antarctica first, because a lot of stuff has happened on this continent that led to the creation of an Antarctic treaty system. So we're gonna learn about it now. The earliest event in Antarctic history can be dated back to 1773, when British naval captain James Cook first navigated the Southern Ocean. At certain points in his voyage, he was only 80 miles away from Antarctica's coast, but he never actually found the continent. There is still debate about who was the first person to actually discover Antarctica. Some individuals believe that it was American John Davis. However, most historians agree that in 1820, Thaddeus von Bellingshausen became the first person to actually step onto the continent. Only three years later, James Weddell will set a record for traveling further south than any explorer before him. If you were able to tune into a past lecture, that last name should sound familiar, and that is because Weddell seals, the world's southernmost mammal, were named in James's honor. A lot happened in Antarctica during the 20th century. In 1911, with the help of sled dogs, Roald Amundsen and his team are the first people to ever reach the South Pole. History is made again in 1935. Explorer Carolyn Mickelson becomes the first woman to ever go to Antarctica. Mount Carolyn Mickelson exists off the coast of Antarctica and is still named today in her honor. Then in 1959, the original 12 nations signed the Antarctic Treaty and the Antarctic Treaty System is established. I'm gonna pass it over to Madeline. She will share more with you about what the Antarctic Treaty System is, what it accomplished through its establishment, and what it still accomplishes every single day. Take it away, Madeline. So before we talk about the Antarctic Treaty System, we have to figure out what is a treaty. And so you might know what a treaty is, but if you don't, it is a formal agreement between two or more countries and used as a means to establish peace and legal obligations. And treaties are normally formed usually after a war, but not always. And they can be about like human rights to environmental protection. And then a great example of a treaty is the Kyoto Protocol, which limited greenhouse gas emissions that were from industrial countries. And then I'll turn it to Vanessa, who will talk about Antarctic treaty systems. As mentioned earlier, the Antarctic Treaty was first signed in 1959 on December 1st. Originally, only 12 countries signed the treaty, but now 56 nations are a part of the Antarctic Treaty System. The treaty claimed that Antarctica is a free zone for every single country, granting every nation on Earth the freedom to conduct scientific research in Antarctica. However, military activity of any kind is strictly prohibited, both on the continent and its surrounding waters. Rigid environmental protection measures and strict regulations are put in place, assuring that Antarctica's fragile ecosystem remains undisturbed and unharmed by human activity on the island. We've been referencing these original 12 nations a lot, but we haven't actually told you which nations were part of the original 12. Amin is going to share that with you now, along with some pretty interesting facts for the rules if you're born in Antarctica. Yeah. 
Okay, so of the original 12, the ones are highlighted in orange. Can anybody tell me what some of those are? Yep, the United States. Yep, South America, Europe, Australia. Yep. So if, any, if you're wondering about Antarctica's birth rates, they actually have the lowest birth rate, lowest infant mortality rate, as there have only been 11 children born in Antarctica and none have passed away. The protocol for a child, child born in Antarctica would be the same as a child born at sea. They would take the nationality of their parents, and if their parents come from two different countries, then they would choose their citizenship. Actually, in the 1970s and 1980s, Chile and Argentina sent pregnant women to Antarctica to strengthen their claim on the continent by using the argument of um, having a few of their citizens born there. <coughs> Vanessa, or Madeline? We'll take you up next on the next slide. <laughs> All right, so now I'll talk about like the day in the life of someone who might live on Antarctica. And so there are actually is no permanent human residency on Antarctica, but there are many people who work in the station, such as the McMurdo Station. And some of these are scientists, many scientists from like institutions and universities will work in Antarctica such as biologists, chemists, oceanographers, and so on. And then we also have su support staff, which these are people who help run the stations on Antarctica. They can be chefs for the scientists or like maintenance and security. And then the USAP management, which is run by the United States Antarctic Program, and they will help manage the operations held by the scientists. And obviously we have artists and writers, and these are like journalists and artists who will come to Antarctica to help the public under, Ooh. <laughs> the public understanding on what is like Antarctica and what it does. And then there are many like daily tasks that people do on Antarctica and this is maintenance where everyday maintenance has to like is be, to be done such as like fixing computers malfunctions or servers. And then there's a lot of like snow and ice in Antarctica and sometimes it gets in the way of duties people have to do. So if there was a large amount of snow people would have to shovel the walkways and roads. And then obviously teamwork is a very important thing on Antarctica where everyone must help each other when needed. And then I'll turn it to Callum who will go back to a turn and talk. Okay. No, thank you, no, no. Um, okay, so a lot of information, right? A lot of new things that I've even learned at this uh, Team Science Cafe event, every single one, it's been something new. It's been a lot of fun discovering more and more about Antarctica. But um, so, let's see, what did we learn about the politics or policies or who governs it? Anything that stood out to you today? Turn to the person next to you and just for a couple seconds, name one thing that stood out to you. Okay, let's come back together. Okay, let's just, a couple of people, let's hear. What, what did you learn? Yes. Okay, so you're saying it's the rarest animal that was named after a human being, okay. Well, yes, so we did talk earlier about Weddell seals, and we just learned that the last name Weddell, he, it was named after that explorer, right? Nice, cool, okay, anyone else? What stood out to you guys, or my friends? Yes. Yeah, it has that feeling. It, it can kind of sound like it's a free zone, in a sense, where it's like no one really owns it, in a sense, right? Good, yeah, anything else? Yes. Oh, interesting. Other nations sending pregnant women down there so that way they can strengthen their claims to the land. Yes, we'll take one more. Mm 
Yeah. Hmm. Yeah, so my friend was saying how military is banned down there, and that really stood out to him. Right, that's really interesting. We thought maybe that there were military down there, but it turns out that there actually isn't. Cool, thank you all for sharing. Let's move on to our second point. What was the most interesting thing? I mean, the thing that really, if you're gonna walk away and share with your friend that you learned here at the aquarium, what was the most interesting thing that you learned about this so far? Go ahead, turn to your neighbor and talk, sorry. <laughs> Okay, let's come back together. Let's see, what stood out to you about this presentation? Go ahead and just share with me. I heard a lot of talking, let's see. Maybe someone from the middle here, the middle zone. I'm pointing to you. You're pointing to her, she's like, no, not me, looking all over the place. That's me in class, I know. Who, what, what stood out to you? I know earlier we said the military, right? There's no military presence, right? Okay. Yes, what about you, my friend? Oh, thank you. Yeah, he was saying how well-informed the teens were. Very good. They put a lot of time into researching and, and learning. And overall, this whole series, they've kind of become many experts on Antarctica. Who knows? Maybe one day they'll go, right? Cool. Yes. Okay. Okay, so the military is there helping in terms of transportation. They're supporting the science. Mm -hmm. Oh, wow. That's interesting. So, yes, our scientists were saying how the folks down in Antarctica, the military, have really been there to support, and other countries kind of have different amounts of military support, and that even they've cooked for you all. Right, right, right. So not for defense, just support. Okay, interesting. Thank you so much. Okay, now one final question. This is the one that is the most important in my opinion because as scientists, it's all about asking questions and trying to find out answers. That's literally kind of, well, that's what science is, right? So what would you like to know about Antarctica? What do you still want to know? Uh, turn to the person next to you. If you haven't talked to someone on the other side of you, reach out to the person and, and make friends and, and ask, what would you still like to know about Antarctica? Okay, so go ahead and chat. Come back together. So, what would you still like to know? Let's let's see if you guys. Let's see uh, this group right here. My friend with the glasses in the middle. What what are you guys thinking? Oh, how it was formed, as far as like by by humans like going down there, or just how it was formed in general. Oh, the geography of it. Okay, interesting, good question. Mm -hmm. hmm. Hmm. Okay, so he asked, my friend back there, um, for those of you who are watching online, I'm just gonna restate what they said so they don't feel left out, but he was saying how Right, what is the point of this treaty, right? Why, why a treaty? Why only Antarctica, right? So our scientist has a lot to say about that. Thank you so much. Anyone else? Okay, what about the second row back here? What do you guys think? My friend in the red, with, with in the red and blue stripes? <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, 
what do you think? What is something you would like to know about Antarctica or about Antarctic trees or anything like that? Your friend's laughing at you, putting you on the spot, I know. What are you thinking, though? What do you think? <laughs> That's OK. That's OK. Any questions? What is your biggest question about Antarctica in general? Like, what would you like to know? Mm, oh, maybe. OK, so my friend was just saying how she wants to learn more about the animals in there, the ocean. Maybe is there anything that hasn't been discovered yet? That's interesting because the scientists are down there now, right, trying to find out that answer. And they need a lot of support. And kind of how that process looks like is all governed by people, right? So that's kind of what we'll, we'll be talking about today. How can we discover more of those things and make sure that we're doing so sustainably? We're doing it in a way that the oceans can continue to survive, right? Um, and no one's going down there and taking too much or, or doing the wrong things and messing up our ecosystems down there, right? So it's all interconnected together. So very good. Thank you so much for sharing all of your questions, everyone. We really appreciate hearing from you all. Um, and we are going to welcome up our scientist, Dr. Deneb, and to hear a little bit more about Antarctica. Let's give her a big round of applause. Thank you. Well, hello, everyone. And while we're waiting for my slides, for the slides to come up, I just want to say how happy I am um, to be here to talk with you today. And um, my name is Deneb Kerenz. I'm a professor at the University of San Francisco. And I'm a marine biologist. And I have a joint appointment in the Department of Biology and also the Department of Environmental Science. And I am also the US delegate to an organization called the Scientific Committee on Antarctic Research. And I am the vice president um, for SCAR, Scientific Committee for Antarctic Research. And I'm also a science advisor to the State Department and I go to the Antarctic Treaty meetings, which are held every year. So in the talk today, I'm going to tell you a little bit about my research and then also talk about the Scientific Committee on Antarctic Research and a little bit about the Antarctic Treaty. Um, my first trip to the Antarctic was in 1985. And um, I've gone down quite a number of times since then. And I've done a number of different things. Um, so to start off with, a little bit about my research. So um, I study phytoplankton. And these are um, the microscopic organisms that are photosynthetic at the base of, an, of marine food webs. And I think some of you have collected plankton samples, so you've seen um, some of these organisms. And my early research was related to the Antarctic ozone um, depletion. And this is a phenomenon that occurs over the Antarctic. Um, it's a, an, a seasonal thing. It happens during the Antarctic spring. And what you see here remember where the pointer is. Um, this is a, an image, a satellite image, showing that ozone depletion over the Antarctic. And so it happens very quickly. It lasts for a, a few uh, months, and then it goes away and comes back the following year. When that ozone gets depleted, there's a lot more ultraviolet radiation, the UVR, which I put as an acronym there, that comes through to the Earth's surface. And the ultraviolet radiation can cause a lot of biological damage. So the things that I was interested in is how do organisms, specifically organisms in the plankton, how do they um, protect themselves from ultraviolet exposure? And then secondly, how do they, how do they um, repair any damage that will occur? So when you go outside into the sun, the, the DNA in your skin cells actually gets damaged. And when that happens, the DNA actually undergoes a conformational change. But you have enzymes in your cells that will identify the damage, literally cut it out of the DNA molecule, and repair it. And almost all organisms on Earth have the same kind of repair pathway. And so the things that I was interested in is looking at phytoplankton to see how they got damaged, how they survived, 
And then this structure, this um, chemical structure you see here, these mycosporine-like amino acids, these are compounds that are found in um, plankton that act as sunscreens. So the same way that you would put sunscreens on your um, skin, these compounds are inside the cells and they help with the um, protection from ultraviolet radiation. Very um, briefly, the kinds of key things that we found were that different species of phytoplankton had different tolerances to ultraviolet light. So this figure over here, right? Um, this figure over here, if you just look at these different lines, you can see that they have different slopes. Um, the one at the top here goes straight across. So this particular species, Carithron, these are um, experiments we did in the laboratory, and we expose them to different amounts of ultraviolet light. And so for Carithron, you'll see that that line goes straight across. It didn't matter how much radiation we exposed it to, it was 100% survival. So it's very, very tolerant. The other cells that are on here, see how these lines come down? They were a lot more sensitive. So even just a little bit of UV exposure and their survival dropped. So we were very interested in trying to understand why this happened. And it turned out to be something that was, we were quite surprised because it was quite straightforward. The difference in the abilities to tolerate UV exposure were related to size. So if cells were very large, um, like this one up here at the top, they did not sustain very much DNA damage com compared to small cells, which are down here. And so we now have this situation where ozone depletion could be essentially affecting the size distribution of cells in the phytoplankton. And if you think about the fact that phytoplankton by krill, what you have is a situation where different sizes of phytoplankton are going to provide different feeding efficiencies for the krill. And so this is a, a, a big question. This is something we have not yet been able to answer. Um, but if you think about the Antarctic food web, what we have is a shift in sizes of phytoplankton could affect feeding efficiency in krill and then could have impacts all the way through um, the Antarctic food web. Again, this is still an open question, something that is um, difficult to study but is of uh, great interest to us. A lot of this work that was done with the um, ozone depletion and effects on plankton was done at Palmer Station. And so I just wanted to show you a picture. Um, this is Palmer Station up here. And on some of these trips, I actually took undergraduate students from the University of San Francisco. And so here you see two undergraduates who came with us on one of our field trips to the Antarctic and were part of the field team. Field team. And so they came out and they learned how to work in the field. They learned how to do work in the lab. Um, it was really fun to have students come down. Um, one of these students, uh, Bethany here, it was um, her first trip out of the country. So her first international trip was to go to the Antarctic. So it was really fun um, to see her and how excited she got about everything. We make a lot of plankton collections with this plankton net. And I just wanted to show you some of the organisms that we collect. And so again, if you've um, collected phytoplankton here in Long Beach, you'll, some of these things probably look familiar because a lot of the groups are the same. And so we have, uh, di Oops. We have diatoms up here, um, a dinoflagellate. Um, this is a tintinid, a polychaete, um, a copepod, and this is something that's referred to as a pteropod or a sea butterfly. And so these organisms make up um, the, the smaller plankton that we find in the Antarctic. In addition to the research that I do with um, the ozone depletion and impacts on biology, I've also been involved for quite a long time with a course that's taught in the Antarctic. And this is a training program that's supported by the National Science Foundation. And it's designed for us to bring down graduate students who are interested in working in the Antarctic and have never had a chance to go. And this um, program is international. We take students from all over the world. And it's designed to give them a chance to learn what it's like to work in the Antarctic, um, for them to learn about key questions in Antarctic science, and essentially to get them prepared to take on their own projects and become um, Antarctic researchers. 
And in fact, um, Amy Moran, who was mentioned earlier today and, and spoke in this series last fall, she came down with this program. And her first trip to the Antarctic was with this training course. As I mentioned, it's um, an international program. Um, over the years, we started in 1994. Um, we have had uh, 270 participants involved, um, 142 different institutions. So these are universities um, from 24 different countries. And so it's been a really rewarding, rewarding thing for me to be involved with. It's an incredible amount of um, fun and excitement to go down there with these groups of people who have never been to the Antarctic, who are really interested in Antarctic science, and to have the opportunity to be able to interact with them and to, to get them to learn all the things they need to know to go on for their own, um, to establish their own careers in Antarctic research. So a few pictures um, of the kinds of activities that we do. Again, uh, this is just an incredible thing to have all these people coming to the Antarctic with you for the first time. It's really exciting, and they get a chance to get out in the field and see what it's like to drill a hole in the ice, and what is it like to try to keep that hole open for a month, and then sample from that and, um, and collect organisms. Um, we also have work that's done in the lab. We have lectures. So this is a really um, intense immersion program to get stu uh, the students involved in the Antarctic and to learn all about what happens in the Antarctic and, and how the logistics work. In the process of doing all of this, even though I work on little things, I have to look in the microscope to see my plankton, um, we also have the opportunity to see a lot of bigger animals. And while I don't work on these, it's always fun to come in contact with uh, the, the larger organisms in the Antarctic. And I think the most fun about it is that they are not afraid of people. They're not used to people. Um, we can be out on the ice working, and if penguins see us, they'll just come running over to see what's going on. So we get to see a lot of penguins and a lot of other seabirds. Although, I have to say, my first trip to the Antarctic, I did not see a penguin because we were there too early in the season. And that was quite a big disappointment. When I came home, all anybody wanted to see was penguin pictures, and I didn't have any. But on subsequent twi trips, I've had a chance to see many, many penguins. So um, it's really fun to be able to see those organisms. And then, of course, we also see a lot of marine mammals, um, the Weddell seals up here, uh, leopard seals, elephant seals, um, and then lots of different kinds of whales. And again, it's just unbelievable to be in a situation like that where these animals are not afraid of people. And we have to go out of our way not to interact with them because it's against the law. Um, but they are just an amazing thing to be able to see um, in their natural environment. In addition to all these nice animals that we see, um, you cannot beat the scenery. The Antarctic is just an absolutely spectacular place. And for us, um, once we get away from the station, we do a lot of work in inflatable boats. And we get away from the station, you turn the engine off. And it's just amazing to be in an environment where you don't hear any kind of human activity. And so it's a, a really special place um, to be able to go to. And I feel really fortunate that I've had the opportunity to be able to go there so many times. Um, in my science career, I've also been able to get involved with um, this organization, the Scientific Committee on Antarctic Research. And as I mentioned, I'm the US delegate to SCAR. Um, SCAR is a large international organization. And I'd like to tell you a little bit about SCAR and what SCAR does and how it interfaces with the Antarctic Treaty. So um, SCAR is an organization that falls under the umbrella of the International Science Council. And it was established um, in 1958. And it came out of the 1957-1958 International Geophysical Year. And this was a, a year of science around the world that was looking at a lot of different things. There was a lot of research done on the atmosphere. There was a lot of research done with geology. And there were 12 countries during that year that worked in Antarctica. And as they were doing that work, they realized that they had a very special cooperative effort. And they wanted to keep that going after the, the in International Geophysical Year was over. And so they created SCAR. And so the same 12 countries that were listed earlier as starting the Antarctic Treaty, those 12 countries are the ones that started this organization. 
And the Antarctic Treaty came about the year after the Scientific Committee for Antarctic Research um, was established. Um, as I said, it was 12 countries that started the program, but today um, we have 34 member countries. We have nine unions from the International Science Council, and then another 12 countries that are just starting their Antarctic programs and as they develop those, and this is something that SCAR does, we help them develop their Antarctic programs, they will then apply for full membership. The Antarctic Treaty, as you just learned earlier, so I'm going to repeat just a little bit um, what was in that, that earlier presentation, um, is essentially the first post-World War II arms limitation agreement. And it has two major aims, and one was to demilitarize the Antarctic, and the uh, second one was to promote science. And so this is what the Antarctic Treaty does. It protects the Antarctic environment and it also um, helps to facilitate international scientific endeavors in the Antarctic. And so the Scientific Committee for Antarctic Research has two missions. Um, one is to facilitate international collaborations. So this is an organization where countries come together Scientists in the Antarctic community come together and are able to, to, to meet each other, to find common ground, find common interest, and develop research initiatives that cross national Antarctic programs. The other thing that SCAR does is to provide science advice, specifically to the Antarctic Treaty, but also to other organizations as well. So I wanna talk a little bit about SCAR. Um, the next slide that I'm gonna show is quite complicated, <laughs> but that's kind of the point of showing it. Um, this is an organizational chart. I don't expect that you can read this or that you know what any of the acronyms mean, but I just wanted to give you a sense of how this organization is put together and how many different things we get involved with. So up at the top, you see the delegates. Um, these are people that are essentially appointed by national committees. So I'm the US delegate from the US. Our national committee is the Polar Research Board, which falls under the National Academies of Science. Underneath here, you see a president and, I'm sorry, uh, a president and um, four vice presidents. So I'm the vice president for science for SCAR. And so each vice president has a whole group of um, subcommittees that, that they are responsible for. We do have a secretariat um, in, in Cambridge, London, in Cambridge, England, uh, these are the only full-time employees, so they kind of keep things going um, on a day-to-day -day basis. Everybody else on this chart, from the top all the way through, are all volunteers. We're all scientists that are just really interested and dedicated to getting Antarctic research um, to progress and to be looking for that next big question. The boxes that you see on here, all these different boxes, the different colors, just represent different kinds of committees. So I would just like to very briefly um, talk about those just so you can get a sense of, of how this um, organization is put together and how it works. So, so we have the science groups um, here, geosciences, life sciences, physical sciences. The red and green boxes are action groups and expert groups. And these groups come about from scientists who get together and decide they want to form a group on a specific topic. So for example, we have an expert group on Antarctic birds and mammals. And so that's a group of scientists that works on birds and mammals. They get together and, and they discuss the various aspects of what information do we need, what information do, are we gonna need in the future, and they help to design research initiatives to be able to answer those kinds of questions. We have an action group on plastics. So even though plastic pollution is coming from other parts of the world, lots of plastic ends up getting carried to the Antarctic. So these are the kinds of things that get covered with these um, expert groups and action groups. Um, we have standing committees. So these um, four light blue um, boxes here. The standing committees deal with things like we have one on social sciences and humanities. So they deal with a lot of aspects looking at the human influence in the Antarctic, including things like tourism. So for example, this upcoming year, it's anticipated that 100,000 tourists are gonna go to the Antarctic. And that's a pretty big impact in terms of the environment. Um, we have a standing committee on the Antarctic Treaty System, and I'm gonna talk about that a little bit more um, coming up. 
We also have um, down here at the bottom in these lighter green boxes, we have some uh, joint initiatives. So for example, we have some research programs with the Scientific Committee on Ocean Research. And so we collaborate with other international organizations and scientists from all these groups get together in order to move science forward in the Southern Ocean and in the Antarctic. And then we have the scientific research programs here in orange. And um, I'm gonna talk a little bit more about these coming up as well. These are our essentially flagship research programs. These are the big initiatives at, that we have going right now and they will um, be addressing again important questions that are coming up in terms of Antarctica. Um, back in 2014, um, we did a massive um, initiative called the Horizon Scan. So kind of a, a bigger version of what was done here before I got up to speak, we kind of canvassed the whole community and, and tried to find out from everybody what they thought the biggest priorities were for research in the Antarctic. And, and again, I think this is something really important about the organization is that nothing is coming from the top down. Everything's coming from the scientists and then bubbling up to, to decide what kinds of things the organization is going to focus on. So the Horizon Scan, um, as you can see from the list here, um, came up with, it had almost a thousand questions that got submitted and then those kept getting filtered and filtered until finally it was distilled down to these six priorities. And so the work that SCAR does is essentially focusing on um, these things that are listed here, like the, the global reach for the Antarctic atmosphere and the Southern Ocean. We know that what happens in the Antarctic has influences globally um, for both weather and climate. Um, what's happening with the ice sheets? This is a really big question in terms of sea levels on a global basis. Um, the, the history of the Antarctic, someone asked about the, the, where did it come from, geology. Um, Antarctic at one time was near the equator. So in, in terms of plate tectonics, it's moved around quite a bit. Um, what about biology in the Antarctic? How does life evolve to live in such an extreme cold environment? Um, Antarctica, number five here, um, is a great place to look at space. And so um, observations of space, learning about the universe, the history of the universe, are things that are, are, are the kinds of science that are getting done in the Antarctic. And then again, trying to recognize and mitigate human influences today is a very important part of um, trying to understand the Antarctic. So I'd mentioned the scientific research programs. Um, we have three of them that are underway right now. Um, I'm gonna talk about each one of these separately for just a, a minute or so after this slide. But we have um, one that's focusing on um, current trends in climate, can't climb now. Um, we have INSTANT, which is looking at Antarctica's contributions to sea level, and then ANTICON, which is trying to increase our efficiency of informing policy with scientific results. So the near-term variability and prediction of the Antarctic climate system um, has a number of research themes, but essentially this program is looking at what's happening to Antarctica today in terms of changes in climate, and then how does that translate to what's happening globally? And so this program is looking at, they're doing a lot of modeling, they're collecting a lot of data, they're setting up databases that anybody can access, and they're trying to answer these questions about what's happening in the Antarctic today, and what does that mean in terms of um, global climate? A lot of the things that SCAR does actually dovetails with things that are happening in other places in the world. And so I thought it would be interesting to just point out that some of our scientists who have been involved, who are involved with Ant Climb now, right, at, right now, um, have actually been attending some international meetings. For example, they attended the International Atmospheric Rivers Conference that was held last fall. And in California, I think we all know what atmospheric rivers are and what's happening in the Antarctic is actually influencing those atmospheric river phenomena that are happening in the Northern Hemisphere. Um, another um, scientific research program that we currently have underway is Instabilities and Thresholds in, in, in Antarctica, INSTANT. And again, they have a number of research themes. The, the broad uh, overall um, theme here is looking at how Antarctica is going to contribute to sea level rise. And like instant, 
um, we have collaborations with other groups. So um, SCAR has a partnership with the International Cryosphere and Climate Initiative. They set up a cryosphere pavilion um, at the Conference of Parties meetings, which are part of the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change. And so SCAR participates in those activities. Instant has this really nice graphic that they put together that essentially shows all the connections that can occur between the atmosphere and the ocean, and the ocean, the atmosphere, and ice. And so these are all the different processes that the scientists that participate in Instant are working on, trying to understand what these linkages are. And these melting of the ice caps is not something that's just gonna have a local impact on the Antarctic. We all know that this is gonna have a, a global impact. And I, I found this on the internet, and I thought, since we're in Long Beach, um, I would use this figure on the left-hand side, and I'm assuming you all know where El Dorado Park is. This is actually my first trip to Long Beach, so I don't know where it is. But on the left side is what the park would look like if we really drastically cut CO2 emissions and tried to hold things at a 1.5 degree um, increase. Um, and on the right side is what's gonna happen if we don't do anything and we get a 3.5 degree increase in, and this is in, in, um, in centigrade, um, increase in temperature, um, you're gonna end up with a lot of water in places where people probably don't wa want it to be. So these are the kinds of things that Instant is looking at. Um, for Anti-Icon, as I mentioned, this one is looking more at how we can be more efficient in getting science to in, in inform policy. And so they have um, a lot of uh, groups going with them. They have an action group on Antarctic tourism. And they have this little scheme that they wrote up showing how um, the data from scientists and, and research groups feed into Anti-Icon. And then that goes into um, one of our standing committees, the one on the Antarctic Treaty System, which is the committee that interfaces directly with the Antarctic Treaty. So the Standing Committee on um, the Antarctic Treaty System essentially goes to the treaty meetings every year. And the treaty meetings are held um, in a different country every year. It goes in alphabetical order of the countries that are members of the treaty. Uh, this year, the meetings are going to be in Finland. And the, Antarctic, um, and the Scientific Committee for the Antarctic Treaty then provides information. Sometimes the treaty will make specific requests and ask us um, for certain information. And other times we will provide, we'll volunteer um, recommendations and information. So it's a two-way street in terms of, of how the treaty gets informed about science that should be important in terms of setting up the regulations that are needed to protect the Antarctic environment and to help manage the Antarctic environment. Um, the other things that you see listed on this slide um, are parts of the treaty. So we help to inform those as well. And then another way that, um, that we try to keep the, the policy, policy makers informed is by, um, we have this website, the Antarctic Environments Portal. And if you go to this website, there are a number of articles there on different issues. And they essentially take the science data and have written it up in a way that policy makers can understand. So the, they're completely, they're not scientific papers, they're actually papers written so that um, the policymakers can be able to find out what the scientists have learned and also get recommendations on how that information can be used. So I've mentioned a lot about climate. Um, SCAR has a big focus on climate issues and um, we have been creating this um, Antarctic Climate Change and the Environment Report for the treaty system. The first report was in 2009. We provide an update every year, and then every 10 years, there's like a major overhaul. And so the last um, overhaul was in 2022. Um, if you're at all interested, this is available at our website. It's a free um, document. It's a PDF that can be downloaded. And it covers a lot of different aspects of um, what's happening in the Antarctic, how atmosphere and ice interact, what's happening with the oceans, um, it, it touches on invasive species. As the Antarctic climate changes, there are species that will be able to live in the Antarctic that were not able to live there before. So there's a, a lot of information in here and it kind of pulls a lot of things together and it represents a lot of the research that SCAR scientists have done. 
So I hope um, that this has given you a little bit of a glimpse um, in terms of how science um, works in the Antarctic at the international level, and then how that science is used to help the people that are making policy, deci policy decisions make the decisions that they do to help protect the Antarctic environment and manage that environment. So if you have any questions, I'd be happy to answer them. Um, so you can actually see s adult krill, you can see with your eye. They're, they're about three inches long. So when we collect them, we can see them in the sample. The, s the, the developmental stages are a lot smaller, so it's easier to see them with a microscope. <laughs> yes, <laughs> so the question was, the first time I went to the Antarctic, did I have to do any trainings? I have to go through training every time I go to the Antarctic. And I've been to the Antarctic over 20 times. And every time I go, we have to go, we spend like almost a week and a half or two weeks. Um, we have to get trained on how to work on the sea ice, um, how to survive in the cold. Um, we do helicopter safety. We have to get trained on how to use snowmobiles and drive the track vehicles. So yes, there's lots of training. They don't, they don't wanna, they're not, they're not gonna just let us go out there without making sure we know we can keep ourselves alive. Yeah, it's it's very intense. Um, it's you know they they'll they'll do they'll do it in the classroom to start with. They'll tell us all the information, but then we go out. So for example, for sea ice training, we have a classroom component, and then they take us out on the sea ice and they show us everything that we need to know about it. I'm sorry. So I actually end up doing both. So I, I do research in the Antarctic, um, but then I also am in a position where I can help to advise. For example, I go to the treaty meetings, not with SCAR, but I go with the, the US State Department. And so when things come up, I can provide science advice to people who are not scientists about what needs to be done in terms of policy. And then with, with in my role as with SCAR, we have an even bigger um, impact in terms of how science gets translated to the policymakers. So I get to do both. Wow. Uh, oh, we are totally fine. Thank you so much. Um, for listening to this presentation. Very interesting, we learned a lot, right? Um, it's not just the nitty gritty science, but it's a lot about leadership, right? There's a lot of leadership that goes on in science. So that's another big thing that we do here at the Aquarium of the Pacific with our youth is we teach a lot about leadership. Um, especially in groups, right? It's gonna be important, it's a transferable skill that can take you anywhere you want to go, right? Leading is so incredible, but thank you so much, Dr. Ganev, for sharing your wisdom with us and for flying all this way to, to share your expertise. Amazing that we have this opportunity. Um, so I'm gonna wave goodbye to our live stream and thank you all for watching at home. For those of you who are watching, I don't know if, if they can see you, but yes, thank you for watching. And we're gonna move on to the next part of